Dr. Foss, first, welcome to the series and, and thank you so much. We're so honored that you've agreed to be interviewed in this series uh, for a number of reasons. One is so many of us have, have read your works. So many of us have looked at your dissertation on Duhal. Uh, and uh, also many of us are aware of your very important relationship with people like Rouleau and Father Ed Malatesta and the founding of the Ricci Institute. Uh, one thing that uh, some people have asked me to sort of say by way of introduction is that you particularly worked in the in the area of cartography. Uh, just the recent uh, catalog of the exhibition in San Francisco, the, there was a catalog called China at the Center that you helped work on. Uh, your dissertation was on uh, Jean-Baptiste Duald. Uh, the, the rumor is that you have a copy of his Description de la Chine. Is that true? I have both the first uh, French edition, 1735, and uh, the English cave edition, 1738 to 41. But for my dissertation, I did not have those. So I actually used the Zikawe copy that Father Rouleau lent to me, which was the second edition from uh, The Hague, 1736. So, so if you look in the dissertation, uh, you have to read the second edition for all of the references. and. Uh, you spoke of uh, China at the center with the exhibit in San Francisco, and it happens that that Rouleau Zikawe copy now is housed at the Ricci Institute in San Francisco. And I was a little embarrassed that my book plate was in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's part of its provenance, provenance. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so, and so Mark Muir said that that was perfectly okay. Oh, right. Well, I think Mark Mir is right. Um, and, then, and then finally, uh, well, you've written a number of book reviews. You've written articles on the Jesuit mission, uh, in terms of Jesuit learning, map making. There's really too much to mention. And again, just to, just to, to say again, you were instrumental in the founding of the Ricci Institute, which is something I hope we have a chance to, to talk about sometime during the interview. Um, and I should say about your copies of the Duhald, my wife is the, the, the dean uh, of our library and uh, says that she thinks you have a better special collections than we do. But <laughs> in any case, let's get to the first question. Uh, well, but just uh, before, oh. the, speaking of the, of the uh, 1736 copy that was from Zikawe, um, the provenance of that is really quite interesting because when Father Rouleau uh, left China in 51 or 52, he uh, basically sent about 35 or 40 books that belonged to the Zikawe Library. He sent them through the post to Baguio in the Philippines. Mm. And so that he had that collection then when he retired to Los, Los Gatos. And I remember asking the Jesuits, if, now that the Zikawe Library is part of the Shanghai Municipal Library, who really owns those 35, 40 books? Uh, I didn't get a definitive answer. Mm -hmm. Well, of course. Um, I know an Australian Jesuit who was in the Zakawe library and they wanted to charge him to take pictures of the pages. And he said, well, this is, I own this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they let him take photographs without charging. So gotcha. well, let, let's get to the first question then. Can, can you tell us, Dr. Foss, really what brought you to the field of China Christianity studies? And in particular, if there's anything that you might want to say about what drew you within that field to specific areas of research. Yes, um, I uh, was born in Juneau, Alaska, and uh, my family moved to Palo Alto, California when I was five or six years old. And my very best, my, my mother had had Japanese friends. Uh, she and I both went to the same Christian science high school in St. Louis, Missouri. And she had Japanese friends. Um, and so I'd always had an interest in, in East Asia. But then in uh, fourth grade, my best friend was Chinese American. Um, his mother was from uh, Beijing and Shanghai, as his, was his father. And his mother came to Stanford. Uh, I think she was one of the very first uh, Chinese co-eds at Stanford. Um, she's still living at 102. Um, but Philip Wu, her son and I became very good friends. And so my interest then turned from Japan to China. And my fifth grade teacher uh, had, was a former Protestant missionary brat. Uh, and he was my, the very first male teacher I ever had. And his name was Ronald Carey. And he just 
who was just such an inspiration to, to me as a 10 year old. So those two things really got the China bug started. Um, I then thought, okay, well, what am I, what am I going to do with, with China? And it happens that one of my mother's friends who from Principia in St. Louis uh, was married to Edwin Reischauer. And uh, so she was a Matsukata. And so I wrote to uh, Ed Reischauer, this was just after he, well, I think it was when he was still uh, ambassador to Japan. And I said, I'm really considering a career in, in East Asia. Should I think about the State Department or academics? And he was about to go back to Harvard and he basically said they both have their drawbacks. <laughs> um, but I decided uh, between my junior and senior year of high school to start taking Chinese. So I, uh, enrolled for an intensive first year Chinese class uh, the summer of 1967 and then started started there. Um, I was going to, to school in St. Louis during the academic year so I had to keep my Chinese up and then I wanted to continue um, with Asian studies and decided to go to Pomona College in Southern California because they had a, a really wonderful long history dating to the 1930s of, of Chinese studies. And uh, in my freshman year, uh, I, I was taking a Chinese history class with a fellow by the name of John Hager, who was a, a recent, recently minted, minted um, PhD from Berkeley. He was an undergraduate at Princeton. And one of the books that we read in that was the translation of uh, the Matteo Ricci journals uh, as edited by Nicolas Trigot. And I was hooked, just absolutely, because here was a Westerner who was interested in China and writing about what it was to be a Westerner interested in China. And I thought that's exactly what I am. And so like, it, it had nothing to do with church history, or, but it had to do with this cultural, I called it cultural deracination, the uprootedness and it just really fascinated me. And of course, the, the first book of the Ricci journals is a, an overview of Chinese civilization. And then the rest of the book is about his own work in China from 1583 to his death in 1610. But that just really interested in me. And so I got interested in Westerners who were interested in China. And then later, John Hager and I did, did a course on Marco Polo and uh, it was just from there. And so my little uh, undergraduate thesis was on Matteo Ricci. And then I thought, I really want to go on to graduate school. Where should I go? Because I was both in European history and Chinese history. And I didn't really want to just concentrate on Chinese history. Um, so the University of Chicago had a program called the Committee on the History of Culture, which allowed you to kind of form your own uh, curriculum. And they had this remarkable person who had just started writing a series called Asia in the Making of Europe, Donald Locke. And I thought, okay, this is a perfect combination for me to, to work with Donald Locke, to work with the Committee on History of Culture. And so that's what I did. So. At the University of Chicago, I continued with my uh, Chinese language. Uh, they had a fantastic uh, professor of uh, in the library science department, T. Uh, H. Chen, that so I could work on libraries and books as well. And then they had He Bingdi, who was the the great Ming historian. So it, it really fit very well. And then in addition, the head of the history of culture committee was a fellow by the name of uh, Carl Weintraub, Jock Weintraub who was a Europeanist. So uh, working with uh, uh, Ping Di He and with uh, Donald Locke and, and Carl Weintraub and then the Renaissance historian, Eric Cochran, it really fit well together. And so for my master's thesis, I worked primarily with Eric Cochran, who was a Renaissance Italian, to compare um, Matteo Ricci's original journal, which had been discovered in the early 20th century, um, and then there was a very good scholarly edition done by Pascal Delia, um, comparing that 
to how Nicolas Trigot um, bodlerized the translation. And it, it was really just fascinating to me to be able to, to uh, use, to, to look at the, the various versions and how here uh, Ricci writes in one way and Trigot, who's doing a propaganda tour in the early 17th century, changes this. And that's how we knew Ricci's work until the 20th century. So I got interested in, in text. And so that when it came time for me to think about a doctoral project, there were two things that interested me. One, the, the Jesuits who returned from China on did propaganda tours in Europe, and particularly Philippe Couplet, who's a, just to me a, a fascinating person. Um, and then, uh, or uh, Jean-Baptiste Duhald, who never went to China, but collected all of these materials from primarily the French Jesuits, and how he then changed texts. Um, I, in my dissertation, I didn't really look at the Duhald manuscripts, which are now the, the, the manuscript work that he did for the Description de la Chine is in the Bibliothèque Nationale, but I didn't do any work in Europe, any archival work. So I was using the, 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 the printed text. And interestingly enough, since, and I, and I never really published the dissertation as, as a book, but if I had, I would like to have looked at the difference between how Duhald took those original manuscripts and changed them, because there are some significant changes. And uh, there, are other, there are other people who've looked at that, and that's something that I regret that I didn't do, because you just kind of wonder, well, why did Duhald make these changes? And of course, the, the rights controversy and all of that was, was gripping. And the interest in, in cartography grew out of Duhald because a great portion of Duhald is cartographic. And so it was only through that that I got interested in the history of maps. And it turned out that there was a, a fellow from University of Wisconsin who then later went to work at the Newbury Library in Chicago, David Woodward, who was beginning a project on the history of cartography just worldwide. And uh, he was teaching a course on the history of cartography, which was a, just a, a brand new field, really, in, in many ways in the, in the uh, late, I mean, the early 70s. And so that's how the cartographic interest came about. And I almost left academe to become a, uh, a map seller, which I'm very glad I didn't do because as, as we all know, that's become a very sketchy profession given the map thieves. Right. So that's, is, is that kind of, oh, that's, that's kind of the genesis. Wow, that is really, truly excellent. You, know, you mentioned, um, and this is, this is, you know, the, the Analyx has this passage, and your mind do not go astray, but you caused me to go astray a little bit here. And that is, you mentioned how your, your entree really was with the Trigo editing of Ricci's diaries, uh, his journals. And well, first, we all know that um, I think that that there's an intentionality in textual editing that it is very meaningful. But um, my first book about Ricci was Spence, um, yeah. it's, but it's not my favorite about Ricci. What is your personal favorite text about, about Ricci? I would say Memory Palace. Oh, really? Okay. Because uh, when Jonathan Spence uh, came to Yale, um, that uh, he was chosen primarily because he was a good writer. And so the, 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 the right team basically said, okay, here's somebody, we can train him to be a sinologist, but he's a really good writer. And Spence is just a wonderful writer. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons that I like it. And uh, when, when uh, Spence was doing Memory Palace, he became uh, very fond of Ed Malatesta. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I came to know Spence largely through then. I had, I had known, I almost went to Yale, um, but I, I'd never studied with Spence. Um, and I, uh, knew, I knew John King Fairbank and Paul Cohen, but um, in some ways, if I had gone to, to work with Spence, I probably would have continued in the, in, in the same field that I, I, I worked on. But I, I think that I would have learned how to be a better writer. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, Spence certainly is one of the greats.
Well, I guess the second question then is, given the, the research that you've done, given this, this sort of chronology that you've provided of research, do you recall any specific discovery that you've made? And this is something that theologians always say, this is not an applicable question to us because we, we, we layer upon scholarship. We don't have discoveries like historians, but, but do you recall a research discovery that made you think differently about your topic? Uh, it's one that I didn't make, but I was absolutely fascinated uh, that Liam Brockie, you know, has pretty much determined that Trigot committed suicide. Right. And that to me was a real shock um, because it's just this despair. And it was alluded to by, uh, um, in the 19th century, there's a biography of Trigo, but nobody really talked about it. And that was, that was interesting. And that got me to thinking, uh, okay, when Voltaire writes about Duhal, he goes, okay, here's this, this Jesuit who's holed up in Paris. He's never been to China. And yet he has written this definitive work that is used for, you know, a century as the, the work on China. Um, and it's been very, very hard for me to figure out who Duhald was as a person. Um, he, of course, was the editor of the Lettres Edifiantes. Um, he did some early minor Latin stuff. Um, but I think he was chosen by the Jesuits because he was a good prose stylist and that he could, and so he was primarily an editor, but it's, it's just, he is such a cipher to me. So that, you know, thinking about the personal life of a Trigot um, and the, the wonderful propaganda tour that he did and that, that, that he just, you know, is, it obviously was a psychological problem, but um, it, it, it was fascinating to me. Um, and that leads me to, to something else that uh, I've really enjoyed doing, and that is um, looking at um, the Chinese who traveled to Europe. And I think that uh, my very favorite book of Jonathan Spence is uh, his book on the young Chinese who is in Europe and also goes crazy. Um, but uh, I, I, Father Rouleau, had a, a real soft spot in his uh, work for a young Jesuit um, who went with Couplet to Europe, and that was Michael Shun, Shun Futsung. And uh, I've done a, an article about that, and much of it was based on work that Rouleau had done but left unpublished. Um, but those, those young Chinese who, who came to Europe I, I think to me that's been the, the most fulfilling part of part of my work. Um, and Michael Shun, I, I think Father Rouleau, he had all of these spiritual children, many of them Jesuits, and he loved them all dearly. But I think that his favorite, very favorite person was Michael Shun. I have not ever, I've never heard that before. That's very interesting. Um, well. Let's move on to the next question, and that is, uh, have you had a specifically meaningful moment uh, during research? And, and the question really is centered towards China. Is there a moment that you recall in China that was specifically meaningful to you? But some have answered in other places, in European archives or in US archives. But have you had a specific moment in research, not one that changed how you think, but something meaningful, an experience perhaps that you'd like to uh, convey? Um, I, I can answer that in, in two ways. One, when, um, when I went into the field, uh, it was in, this was the late 70s when I was looking for work. Um, I was a very hard person to, to uh, hire because I wasn't a Chinese historian, I wasn't a European historian, and the field of what we now call Chinese Western cultural history didn't exist. And um, this is something that when I first was teaching at Loyola in, in Chicago and I broached the idea that, okay, um, the, this, the quatrocentenary yeah, of Ricci's, Ricci's arrival in, in China was coming up in, in 1983. 
And so I, I worked with uh, Charlie Ronan and a couple of the historians who were at, at Loyola to think about doing a conference on Ricci. And uh, this was 1978 that it, we first thought of it. And um, then you know, I, I went to Rome in 1980 and um, then uh, in, there was a Ricci conference in Rome where uh, Pope John Paul II went. And uh, I, I talked with uh, a little bit with Pedro Rupe and, and, uh, and all, and just thinking of the field and at the Loyola conference, which finally did happen, and I was had left Loyola by then, uh, I met Ed Malatesta, who um, had been a professor of theology in Rome. Uh, he'd grown up in Los Gatos, California. He was a, a, a mentee of Francis Rouleau but his real love was China. And so in his 40s, he started learning Chinese and he just really wanted to do something with it. And so I spoke with Malatesta about, we really need to find a place where this new field can have a home. And um, he agreed. And so I went off to, to Los Gatos for a while to work with primarily with Rouleau. And Malatesta and I really, came to fisticuffs on several occasions because I was interested in the field as cultural history. And Malatesta was interested in the missiology of it. Mm -hmm. And that, until he died, that was a, a, a conflict that we had. Um, and it, it, was, it was a good conflict, but it was a conflict that we had. And so in creating the Ricci Institute, I wanted it to be one thing and he wanted it to be something else. Um, and uh, we kind of accomplished both because he could have his life outside of the Institute and work with the, the Chinese Catholic community and, and all. But you, to get back to your specific question, I think that the most meaningful thing to me was seeing the field grow and particularly that it grew not just as a field of European sinologists, but that the Chinese were becoming interested in this as well. And that uh, the whole idea of the Chinese sources and all. And another person that comes into the, the play here is Joseph de Hern in, in Paris. And he had started this entity called the Colloque International de Sinologie uh, in the early 1970s. And it was a group of people, many of them amateur historians, who were looking at aspects of China and the West. And I was absolutely intrigued that you didn't have to be uh, a registered academic to be in this field. There were a whole number of really, really interesting uh, amateurs, uh, people like Knut Lundbeck in Denmark, um, that uh, did just really good work. And I found it was a lot of fun to be outside the academy and working with this. And so uh, I continued to work with Dehanya and tried to keep the Kuluk uh, in, in Chantilly going. And I think we finally finished, I'm just looking here, seven of those volumes. Um, and uh, later with the help of, of the Reach Institute and Malatesta. But it's, it's a fun field because it isn't bound by a strict academic discipline. That was both a blessing and a curse because um, there, were, there were people who really distrusted me that I had this kind of missiological motive for going into the field, but nothing could be further from the truth. And I'm just, I am so happy that that's no longer uh, that's no longer a prejudice in the field. Right. I mean, you, you, I don't think that you're thought of as okay. You're doing this because this is a means of conversion. It's 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 a genuine field now. Right, right. This th this point is such an excellent one. Um, and goodness, what a rich answer. Uh, I, I'm thinking of the founding of the China Missions Group back in 1983, and this is being co-sponsored by what it's the China Missions Group now called the China Christianity Studies Group. And the, the prejudice then was that this, this 
intellectual community was about missiology, was pastoral, was, was missionary, a missionary enterprise. And apparently it was Spence and Fairbank who in a way argued in favor of uh, this academic discipline. And somehow the AAS then had a Gilbert and Sullivan society because they studied the Mikado. And, <laughs> and I guess if you could have a Gilbert and Sullivan society, then you can have a, a, a scholarly group that studies Christianity in China. I will never forget, uh, I think it was about 1983, I, I, I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and John Fairbank uh, invited me to lunch at his house, and we had hot dogs and jello. I remember that, and Paul, Paul Cohen was there as well, and I was telling them about the very beginnings of the idea of the, of the Institute for Chinese Western Cultural History, and Cohen and Fairbank just looked at each other and said, oh, this is really good because this needs to happen. This is something that, that we've wanted for a long time. And I just felt so validated. Right. Well, th that answer actually, in a sense, fun functions as a preface to the next question. But you mentioned something about uh, Father Rouleau, and that is that you had essentially finished a project that he had prepared for. And when I think of Rouleau, I think of someone who has a, an unfinished or un unrolling legacy. It's still unfolding, unfurling. And, um, you know, for example, his work on the rights controversy, people are still relying on Rouleau to think about that question. Um, and I wonder if you might say a little bit more by way of recalling memories of some of these scholars of whom that we, that for many younger scholars are, we're losing them to our memory. Uh, do you have any specific recollections that you think might be helpful or important for us to remember? If I can relate back to the fact that I, I talked about the scholar, the, am the scholar amateurs, um, and uh, you know, and it's really wonderful. There was a fellow by the name of Henry Hart, who was an, an attorney in San Francisco, who wrote about about um, Marco Polo, and his papers are now held at the uh, in the Cal State. Uh, College East Bay, I think, and the Hart papers are really fascinating, but he was one of these amateurs. And one of the reasons that Rouleau didn't publish much, or Albert Chan didn't publish much, is that they were not, they were not pushed by the ac academy to do that. Mm -hmm. And so that, the, and, and Rouleau was a perfectionist. He would just, if you go through his papers, he's just constantly re- writing, rethinking the same thing over and over again, but not getting it done. And Father Albert Chan was the same way. If, uh, if uh, Joe Shebesh from Georgetown hadn't pushed uh, Chan to publish his book on the Ming, like Oklahoma Press, he never would have. And so uh, nobody pushed uh, a, a Rouleau or a Chan. And that, that is, is kind of sad. And that was the reason that Malatesta was brought into the, to the, to the Rouleau project. He was supposed to finish the Tournon right stuff and it didn't get done. But that's because Malatesta was, you know, he had his hands in so many different pies. Um, but uh, so as a counter argument to the fact that um, I enjoy the, the, the fact that they're the amateurs, um, I myself, because I never really had a, a, a tenure line position, was not forced to publish. And Rouleau was not forced to publish. Chan was not forced to publish. And that to me is, 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 is a recollection that I have. And um, somebody like a Henry Hart, and I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with, with his work, but this was in the 30s and 40s. And he was also an antiques dealer as well as an, uh, he was a district attorney in the East Bay of California. But he was absolutely driven to publish. And some of his stuff was published by Stanford University Press and um, the Venetian Adventure and all this stuff. But going through his papers, you realize that he could have done so much more if he had been pushed to publish. Um, and uh, even somebody like a, 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 a John Witek really was not pushed to publish. And I, I think that it is, it's, it's difficult for a lot of uh, Jesuit academics because they hold so many different hats. 
to do that, 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 that may be part of it. I don't know if that, if that answers part of the question, but um, you know, it, it's just when you look at these remarkable early sinologists, and I've done some work on the anthropologist Bertolt Laufer, who was at the Field Museum for a long time and wrote just lots and lots of things, but his archive, much of, much of which was burned by his uh, German Hausfrau wife when he uh, committed suicide, um, he too could have published so much more. And uh, so that it, it's, it's just kind of, it is kind of sad as I reflect upon these people. Of course, uh, Laufer died in the mid thirties, I, so I didn't meet him, but um, there is so much archival information that must be out there. Right. One thing that strikes me about this answer is it, something I've reflected on too as a tenured professor um, who has been pressed, very pressed. I've personally had envy for people like Rouleau who, who can sort of cogitate on, on, on their research uh, and then write with what I would think would be more freedom. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, I think that's an interesting, uh, an interesting thing. And it, certainly your work and, and <clears throat> Rouleau's work and Vitek's work, we all rely on it and read it and it's beloved. So the contribution is certainly yeah. there. They add to the stream. Yeah, but, but you know, uh, I mentioned that Spence was such a good writer and Witek was a wonderful scholar, but a horrible writer. <laughs> right, right. Well, we are approaching our last 10 minutes or so. I wonder if, if uh, just by way of, well, I'm sort of retrenching here a little bit. You, you, you reflect on, you reflected on uh, what I think has been um, attention in, in our field, and that is that we've had so many priests, so many people in ministry who have thought about this. Um, certainly the field of sinology, I would argue, comes from the missionary enterprise. Um, so that pastoral and academic tension has been present. And uh, I've probably been more certainly in the academic way of thinking, at least I've wanted to be. Um, so when we think about the future of the field, um, there are many ways to think about the future of the field. And the question that we've asked everyone, which everyone has said, it's the most hackneyed question, but maybe the, the most difficult to answer, is what hopes do you, Dr. Foss, have for the future of this field? Um, first, you know, talking about the, the, the priest scholars in the field, if you look at somebody like a Pascal Delia, in his writings, I don't think that there's a hint of missiology in it. I think that he is, he is a, a true sinologist. So you don't, you don't have to, you, you don't have to sacrifice that, that to, to missiology. Um, but one of my hopes for the field is seeing some of the good scholarship that's coming from historians um, from China, um, that they are able some, often to look at um, sources in a, in a different way. Sometimes they're a little too uh, caught up in what's trendy in terms of how, how you do scholarship. But, you know, I, I look at, at somebody um, like an Eugenio Menegon, and I, and I, I really have hope for the field. Um, so I, I think that, that, that there are those people and it's very interesting as to how they come to the field because they're not coming from a, uh, a, a religious background. Um, as a, just a little personal note, um, I did not grow up as a Catholic. Um, I met Father Rouleau uh, because I was studying in Taiwan and uh, there was a fellow um, who was at the Tian Center in Taipei and I was interested in Matteo Ricci, and this feather, fa Father Foley, I think was his name, he said, well, if you're interested in Ricci and you live in California, you should see this guy, Francis Rouleau, because he's in Los Gatos. And so that's how I first met Father Rouleau, and we were talking about Matteo Ricci and scholarship. And I went to graduate school, and I converted to Catholicism, um, largely because of 
my great affection for Francis Rouleau. So in some ways, I am like a kind of a convert of, of Ricci. So I, I came to it in, 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 a, in a very different way than coming as, as a Catholic than interested in uh, than the, the church in China. Um, so that's just a kind of a personal aside. But um, I, I really uh, enjoy seeing what younger scholars are doing with this incredible trove of, and I, I can't remember who said it, but that the interesting thing about the Western perception of China as written is that sometimes they speak of things that even the Chinese have not considered. That because as outsiders, they're looking at, at, at China's, China, China and China's history as an outsider. And that um, that's both a blessing and a curse. But I think that in many ways, uh, and, and I, I can't remember who said it, but that basically they, something like the Ricci, the, particularly the first book in the Ricci journals, um, he's talking about things that you wouldn't find in Ming sources. And so that's a hope for me for the, for the field as well. Well, that is a, a really perfect place, I think, to end. Um, let me again say what an honor it, it was to interview you. And um, the people who are working on this series have asked me to convey to you, I hope you have a good summer. We hope you have a good summer. Juni Shanti Jen Kang, wishing you the very best of health. Um, and again, um, Dr. Foss, thank you so much for this, 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 uh, this interview. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.